for the holy hours all throughout the course of the night uh, so that uh, we each hour until tomorrow morning will be 7.30, the uh, benediction, and then the mass afterwards. So tomorrow morning, 7.30, the benediction with the retreat schedule, not the 8 o'clock, but 7.30, uh, the retreat schedule, benediction, and mass immediately afterwards. Few considerations in this stage of the holy retreat. There was a great earthquake at 3 p.m. on Friday. So many things happened during that earthquake. Our Lord Jesus Christ cried out with a loud voice and he gave up the ghost. It was an exceedingly loud voice. And it's interesting what happens and who are the first ones to suspect the great victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is the soldiers. They have seen so many men die. And they saw each man that they killed grow weaker and weaker as he grew closer to death. But remember that this man came to defeat death. And on Saturday, we're going to say in the Holy Bravery at Holy Saturday, in the Tenebrae, O Mors Ero Mors Tua. O death, I will be your death. Death, thou shalt die. <coughs> This is what our Lord Jesus Christ said to death. One cannot imagine the power of that sound. Remember that during the holy sacrifice of the Mass, every time the Mass is celebrated, God the Son becomes man. His real human flesh enters into the host body and his blood and his soul and divinity. He's a real man. And a man is of time and a man is of place. We learn in our philosophy class the reality of anything that's real. It is a substance with nine accidents. Nine predicaments alongside that tenth one. Nothing that is real does not have time and place. So when God the Son re-enters the host in his humanity. He enters at a time, a very specific time, and he enters in a very specific place. The time is exactly 3 p.m. On Good Friday, the place is the Rock of Golgotha outside of the city of Jerusalem. And at that moment, Christ cried out with a loud voice, and it was final cry the final and horrible and loud scream of our Lord Jesus Christ is completed, and this ghost goes out, and his soul and his body are ripped apart. It's the most violent ripping. Because he is in the fullness of his power, he is in the fullness of his strength when he dies. The sound causes an earthquake, shakes the entire world, down to the very center of the earth where hell is shaken. When the priest says, Hope est even carpus meum, at the end of that sound, which the Holy Church tells us must be said in a very low voice, should not be heard ideally even by the servers, but only barely by the priest himself. 
This is my body. Hocus salem carpus meum. Last word we say in Latin is mine. When he says that word, there is sacramental separation. The ripping apart. The moment of the ripping apart of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. He does not become man as a baby. He doesn't become man. Sermon on the Mount. He becomes man at that precise moment. This is the most sacred moment in all of history. And there's the most sacred moment in his life. It was the moment that he met in a most violent and most powerful way, death. He cried out with an exceedingly loud voice. And this is what caused the soldiers to begin to believe. Because they knew that no man who was at the moment of death has any strength. And when he speaks, you put your ear next to his mouth and you try to hear what he says, but you can't catch it. Dies in weakness and dies in a whimper. But this man, after suffering infinitely more than it is possible for a man to suffer, after being beaten and scourged and crowned with thorns, a bloody sweat, the pain of the heart by the mockery and spitting upon his heart and upon his whole being, by our mouths, and by our tongues, and by our thoughts, and by our hearts. That alone is enough to kill him. All these wounds are upon him. <coughs> and he is in the fullness of his strength. He cries out with an exceedingly loud voice. Gives up the ghost. And the soldiers note this death. And they are the ones who say, indeed. Must have been. He was, they say in the past tense, the Son of God. So many things happened to that earthquake. When there is a dam, there is an infinite amount of water behind the dam. At some point, the dam breaks. And when it breaks, out comes so much water with so much power. This was the moment the dam of grace broke. And the grace flows with great speed and great power and great heat through that crack of the dam. And from there is this moment and this loud voice and from this mail. Our holy religion, which is the religion that binds real men to God, which is what religion means. This holy religion depends on a man. This is my body. And what is this body for? To be ripped apart. And when it is ripped apart, what happens? The justice of God is completed. His just anger is wiped out. The father no longer sees sin, for he sees that this man has paid the price. He took on all our sins, and he paid the price. He has defeated the cause of death. Many modern doctors, they attack the symptoms. Just get rid of the headache, get rid of the blight, but they don't attack the disease. Our Lord Jesus Christ was not one to attack the symptoms. He goes after the cause. He goes after the disease. And the disease is sin. Who's sin? Male. Nice. It's most person what happens at the Holy Cross on every side. Therefore, at this time of death, when God dies, 
there should be anger. There should be a desire of vengeance for the wrath of God is very powerful. But what does the Father hear? He hears the voice of his Son and he hears the cry And is the cry that I have taken on the sins of all men? Let the punishment come upon me. The mayo is so very important. It is at that moment that there is an earthquake. It is that moment that the gates of hell are defeated. And there is a great shaking of the earth, the shaking of the heavens, and the shaking of hell. And no one knows exactly what has happened, except for God the Father, who is appeased. And God the Holy Ghost, who is the divine love, whose love can now go out through that crack. As the Father hath sent me, I also send you, he said to those apostles. And I will send the paraclete, for he will teach you many things. And whatever he shall teach shall be what he hears. The paraclete is trapped. Now, by that male, by that loud voice, by that incredible cry, as the fathers tell us, was like unto the cry of those Jews who walked seven days around the city of Jericho, and they cried out with a loud voice, and the walls fell down. And those on the other side of the wall were defeated and destroyed. Who lived? Rahab On the wall. She was in the unsafest place to be on that day. But she had made a deal. Whoever is in this house, you will not harm them. And they accepted the deal. Therefore, the wall collapsed everywhere except at her house. The soldiers were told, kill every man, every woman, and every child, and every beast in that city. But where you see the house with the red towel hanging out, the red cloth hanging out the window, touch no one in that house. The mayo has much power. Now when this earthquake happens at 3 p.m., It strikes into the heart of those eleven men that loved our Lord Jesus Christ so much. Confused, tired, afraid. Their entire life was only around him. And now he's dead. He is completely it rips out their hearts. What is our Lord doing to their hearts? He's cutting a hole. He's making a crack. Why is he making that crack? The crack that is made in the wall of his heart causes the blood to go out. But he's making a crack in our hearts to let his blood flow in. No blood will flow out. Our Lord himself said, I thank thee, Father, that one of these shall be harmed. They were afraid. They thought they would be harmed. But they were not harmed. But their hearts were literally broken at that 3 p.m. Now the Holy Ghost can begin to enter their hearts. 
Now they can begin to learn and understand what he had told them in the last three and a half years. A little while and I shall go away. And you shall not see me. And you shall be sorrowful, he had said. And they have that sorrow. They have it. Meanwhile in hell, Lucifer is worried. He knows something very bad has happened to his kingdom. And he wants to make sure that this enemy of his is more than dead. Therefore, he has one of the soldiers, the most wicked of them, take a spear, pierce the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wisely, the devil is afraid of Jesus Christ when he's dead. And the fathers, the Holy Mother Church, asks us the same question about the saints. One of the requirements of our Holy Mother of the Church is when someone is to be raised to the altar as a saint of God, he must have done great things in his life. He must have had great love. He must have done miracles. But he must be busier after his death. He must still perform miracles. He must still do work. For in the kingdom of God, death is no excuse. He must preach after his death, like St. Denis. St. Denis, the bishop who converted Paris, the Roman soldier cut his head off while he was preaching the word of God. His head fell upon the ground, and Dennis reached down with his hand and picked up his head, held it in the air, and said, I'm not done yet. And he continued to preach. A little thing like a sword cutting off the head did not stop his sermon. Death should not stop us. Death has been conquered by our God. Death has been conquered by our Lord Jesus Christ. And death has become most wonderful. It is in death that we are transported into a new life. But he will learn to he will teach his apostles about the beauty of death. Right now they must experience some pain. Caiaphas has gone back. He is at the temple. And in the temple he sees that earthquake. And the earthquake causes the temple to be adored, to, to be cracked and damaged. And he sees in his own eyes the veil of the temple, which is 60 feet tall. He sees that veil ripped from top to bottom. Because God is the one that did the ripping. He ripped that veil from top to bottom, not from bottom to top. He ripped the veil from top to bottom, and the very eyes of Caiaphas and the presence of God went out of the Holy of Holies. And it wasn't the Holy of Holies anymore. Meanwhile, the apostles with broken hearts go away. They don't understand. Our Lord Jesus Christ descends. As the Apostle Creed tells us, he descended into hell. That is, he went beneath the surface of the earth. Hell means a place underneath. There he visited the souls in the limbo of the just. There he met Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Adam, and Eve, and all the great saints of the Old Testament. And he spoke to them about his work and about the completion of the victory. There also came very quickly after he entered St. Dismas into that holy place. He was about to open the gates of heaven. Then we arrive on that third day, Easter Sunday morning. And the Lord Jesus Christ rises from the dead. It is in the early dawn, about three in the morning, before the dawn. Remember, there were a manifold of soldiers, Lavish Josephus tells us, 100 soldiers who were commanded by 
the uh, pilot to guard the tomb because of the prophecy that Lord Jesus Christ had rise from the dead. And they were to make sure that no one would steal the body. They were there only a few yards away from their fort, the fortress, the Antonia, an idiotic assignment, sleeping overnight in the graveyard where they could be sleeping in their barracks. And there they stayed. In the middle of the third night, what happens? There was a great light that came from that central tomb in which our Lord Jesus Christ was buried. The stone was rolled back. And there was an angel that stood in front of them. And the gospel tells us they were as dead men, filled with complete fright. And our Lord Jesus Christ came out of the shroud, and it lay there inside of that tomb. And then he came forth and rose from the dead, and the hundred soldiers saw it. It was soldiers that said at 3 p.m. indeed he was the Son of God. The soldiers that proved that he rose from the dead. And where did he go? The first place he went was to his mother. She is the mother of sorrows. And they went straight to his mother. She was alone these last three days, from Friday 3 p.m. until Easter Sunday morning. She alone held that faith amongst those there in Jerusalem. They were wounded. They were beaten down. They were sorrowful unto death. And she had to hold up those apostles that they not die of grief. And she held them up. And she waited patiently for her son to rise. Then he comes and sees her in the early morning. And when he sees his holy mother, whatever sorrow there was in the mother of sorrows, in her seven sorrows, whatever sorrow there was in her son, his sorrow is completely eradicated and completely wiped away. And we have for the very first time Finally, the purpose of the world is fulfilled. God told Adam, I made this world for you, so that you can use it in order to get to me. And when you arrive at me, you will see me in the greatest beauty, and the greatest glory, and the greatest peace, and the greatest happiness, and the greatest joy. You will see me face to face as I am. And this will be your joy forever. A beatific vision, which we call heaven. Finally, for the first time, there is beatific vision. The mother of sorrows sees her son. The son sees his mother. And all sorrow is gone from her. In fact, the sorrow is so gone that whatever the terrible pain that was in her heart that is beyond anything that we can imagine, it is nothing compared to the joy of his presence. He shows his scars. He is completely healed of all pain. But he shows his scars, the glory of the battle, the glory of the fight. There is so much beauty in those scars. And then, after a short respite with his father, he goes to birth. When we consider here the first apparition recorded in the Holy Gospel, Mary Magdalene and the Holy Women, they are filled with a great grief. Each moment from Good Friday until Easter Sunday morning, the grief grows worse. And they are so frustrated. Because they had to move with such haste. They couldn't properly complete the burial because it was the great past. And they had to complete the burial of Christ by 6 p.m. And he died at 3. Didn't get the body until sometime after 4. They had to be complete, completed the burial before 6. They had no time. In the last few minutes, Joseph and Mary of Arimathea came. Demanded the body of our Lord. Soldiers pierced his side. 
They gave him the body, and they had only a few minutes to bury him. No time to complete all the ceremonies. And they were in such pain, they couldn't even do a proper burial. So in the early morning of that Sunday, they're going to complete the burial. They can at least do that. So they get the myrrhs and aloes, and they travel to the tomb. On the way to the tomb, they remember that there is a large stone in front of the tomb. The pilot had put a hundred soldiers, as Flavius Josephus, the great Jewish historian, tells us, a manifold of soldiers, which is one hundred. One hundred soldiers are guarding the tomb. The stone is heavy. And they ask the great question, who shall roll back for us the stone? So many questions we have. Who shall roll back for us the stone? It's interesting when we consider the great battlefield. When we go to heaven, one of the greatest challenges we will have is to explain to our fellow saints in heaven our stupid questions and our foolish worries. This is the God who created the highest mountains, created all the stone that is upon the earth, who holds the entire earth in the palm of his hand, and they're worried about a little rock. It seems so heavy, so hard to remove. It's very little in the hand of God. It's very big to these girls. How should the stone be rolled back? We run into so many obstacles in our journey to our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know what the answer is. We don't know how the obstacle is going to be removed. But here we see the holiness of the holy women and what was right about their heart. Because remember during these three and a half years, our Lord Jesus Christ was teaching things on the outside. He was saying things with his mouth. Pharisees heard those words. The Sadducees, the crowd heard those words. But what did our Lord Jesus Christ say? I will teach them in parables, so that seeing they will see what they shall not understand, and hearing they shall not understand, hearing they shall not hear, and seeing they shall not see. He spoke, he performed miracles, they saw them with their eyes, they heard his words. What on earth did he mean? What did he want of them? They did, his words did not enter their hearts. However, for these holy women, and for eleven of the twelve apostles, the words did enter their hearts. One thing we must note about Easter Sunday morning, something like the last eight days of the ark. Remember that God closed the door of the ark eight days before the flood. If you came to the ark on day 7, day 6, day 5, day 4, day 3, day 2, day 1, you could not get in. It was too late. You had to be there at least 9 days before that flood. The unicorn didn't make it. He was late. And if we didn't make it during those 8 to 9 days, it was too late. So many people wanted to be the friend of Christ after 3 p.m. on Good Friday. The door is shut. It's too late. You're either already with him or you're already against him. No one is saved on Holy Saturday. No one is saved on Easter Sunday. The day of salvation is Good Friday and the salvation is before 3 o'clock. Three o'clock is the last moment. Three o one, too late. Remember that there were many people in that crowd. After three o one, when they saw that Jesus Christ was dead, they went home weeping and striking their breasts. They are now in hell. The holy women, not the holy women, but the women of Jerusalem. They were weeping. 
They feel so sorry for him. They are now in hell. As St. Alfonso says, there is a time and there is a time. There is a time of grace and there is a time of judgment. Our Lord Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday morning, he will visit those who already love him. He will visit those who have been converted. Remember Longinus. He pierced the side of Christ true after 3 p.m. But then he saw the blood and water come out. And he saw and he believed. And he bore testimony, says St. John. And his testimony is true. He was saved by the sacred heart. The holy women don't understand in their minds. The apostles don't understand in their minds. He's been dead for three days now. And they have no plans. They realize that Peter said such true words. But a year and a half before he said, Lord, thou alone hast the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? And now he's dead. And there's nowhere to go. They've got emptiness deep in their hearts. There's nowhere to go. And they don't want to go anywhere. Because there's only one place worth going. And that's wherever he is. And he's gone. So therefore there's no place to go. Therefore our Lord comes to them. The holy women are going to that tomb to complete the burial. Who shall roll back the stone? They don't know. They have no answers. But they cannot stop. St. Paul says, Caritas Christi urgenos. <coughs> what does the charity of Christ do? It urges us and pushes us on. Even when there's no place to go. We keep going. And so they went on without an answer to their question. Without a hope <laughs> the stone being rolled back. But they went on. Because this is a time where you either have already Jesus Christ in your heart or you do not. And they have Jesus Christ in their hearts. Their mind says, no point in going on. But they go and they go. They arrive at the tomb, and they see the soldiers have run away in fear, and there's a big mess. And they see the stone is rolled back, and they see the shroud folded, and they see a strange man there. And the strange man says, he is risen, he is not here. Go and tell Peter and the apostles that he will meet them in Jerusalem. Look at the place where they have laid. In Galilee, we live in Galilee. Look at the place where they have laid him. The angel was not upset. It's a beautiful place where Christ was laid down in his death. The scripture tells us, and they left behind their murders and aloes. They left behind the murders and aloes. Bitterness, any ugliness of heart. Somehow, whatever's left of it is gone now. And they are filled with a desire to say what they have seen. <coughs> this is the role of the Holy Women. You're not supposed to be caught. <clears throat> Go and tell the world what you have seen. The woman of the well, she wasn't quiet. He went straight down into the city and said, I have seen Christ. The 80-year-old Anna, Simeon was very wise. Simeon spoke a few words. Simeon taught the mother of God. How can we teach the mother of God? 
Let's say Simeon taught her. But Adam was just a big mouth. Mm -hmm. And she went to the temple and she talked to everybody. Over 80 years old, the child is here. The Son of God is here. He's here, he's here, he's here. Who will learn on the day of judgment how many souls were benefited by her holy words? Crazy old. And now the women, they leave behind the myrrhs and aloes, and they run into the streets, and they say what they have seen, and they don't even know what they have seen. They don't understand what it means. But they tell what they have seen, and there's something in their hearts that recognizes we have not seen him, we do not believe he is risen from the dead, we know that that's impossible, but we've seen something wonderful. Somehow Mary Magdalene comes back to the tomb. Because she isn't interested in just talking to everyone, she wants to seek him. St. Augustine says, Mary Magdalene is first, she calls Christ forth from the tomb because she seeks him even when he cannot be found. This is why we have the custom of the Easter egg hunt. She went and the tomb was empty. Where is he? The Easter egg is the symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hunt used to involve only one egg. Now they throw a thousand of them out there. It's a symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ because it is a sealed tomb. A little chicken on the inside. No one helps him out. He pecks his own way out. He leaves on his own schedule. He leaves on his own power. He exits the sealed tomb at the moment of his choosing. By his own work. And our Lord Jesus Christ came out from the tomb by his own power, at the moment of his own choosing, by his own work. And they didn't know it, but they must find him, and therefore she looks. And as she's walking around looking for him, she finds a gardener. She finds a gardener. St. Bernard has a beautiful sermon concerning this gardener. St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He has just conquered the world. He has defeated Satan. He smashed hell to bits. He has destroyed death. He is the greatest warrior of all time. And she thinks he's a janitor. How does he carry himself? as he comes out from war. She thinks he's a janitor. The guy that changes the light bulbs, the guy that pulls the weeds. And when St. Bernard says, well, have you thought of me as a gardener, a husbandman? Well, have you thought of me as a gardener, for I am a gardener. I alone till the dirt in your soul. I plant the seed. I water it and I make it grow. I am a gardener. And he was pleased that he thought she thought he was a gardener. And she says to him, the gardener, where have you laid him? Master, where have you laid him? That I might go and complete the burial. There were three men crucified a few days ago. This is a cemetery. Which him? Which one is the one you're coming to find? The fact is, when something's important to a woman's heart, the man is supposed to know. And there is hell to pay. He better know. <laughs> Where have you laid him? 
And our Lord Jesus Christ says the first word spoken after the resurrection. He said, may you, at 3 p.m. on Good Friday, he let out a loud voice, and his body and soul were ripped apart. Father, in the hands I commend my spirit. And he cried out with a loud voice, and in that cry is all the prayers of the church of 2,000 years, all the tears of the saints, all the sighs of love that have risen up to God, all of the prayer for sin that's wiping away, all are in that sigh. So much is in it as it cracks forth when he says, Mayo. Now, what is his first word three days later? Mary. It's all he says. Mary. How does he say that word? It is the name of Mary Magdalene. There is a way that only he can say it. There is an infinite love. He died to save her. He came back to see her. And he says her name. And no one can imitate that sound. We must come accustomed to the sound of our Lord. But this is impossible if we don't say our rosary. This is impossible if we don't speak to our Lord in our daily life. He will speak back in a most quiet voice. Do we know the sound of his voice? It is not time to learn the sound of his voice. She already knows it because before he died, she sat at the foot of our Lord while Martha was busy doing the dishes and she listened to him and she heard his voice and she memorized a sound that can only come from him, and that no one can imitate that sound. Maybe he's been dead for three days. Maybe he's gone. Maybe she thinks he's a gardener. Maybe he looks like a gardener. She doesn't recognize his face. But when, she, when he says one word, immediately she knows it is him, and she cannot be deceived. Consider the great agony of St. Mary Magdalene. How quickly it's wiped away. We have many sorrows in our hearts sometimes, or at least we think we do. We have many wounds that lasted many years. We've gone through so many battles, it will take so long to heal all those wounds. Or so we think. Her wounds, which are deeper than all of our wounds combined, they were healed in an instant. One instant. By one word from the infinitely loving God made man. She then goes to embrace his feet. Always at his feet. He thinks she is in heaven. He puts his hand up on her forehead and says, No le me tangere. You cannot touch me now. For you will not touch me until hereafter. And here our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us a secret. What did he tell his apostles on Easter, Ascension Thursday? I am going up into heaven. And as you see the Son of Man go up in the clouds, you won't see me again. Until I come back in power and majesty on the last day, more than 2,000 years from now. I'm going to heaven and you won't see me again. You won't see me again. That's what he said. Only he wasn't telling the truth. Always makes an exception. You cannot touch me until hereafter when you're in heaven. And what is he doing? He's touching her. It's very much like the mother, as we mention often, making the cake. You can't have any cake, it's for dessert. And that one piece, all right, one, don't you ask anymore. Bread. <laughs> Another piece, no. Bread. 
No, no, brat. You little brat. Now I gotta make another kid. <laughs> this is the way our Lord is. You cannot touch with me. I am not coming back. You hear? You will never see me until the last judgment. Where is he now? Where is his body? Where is his soul? It's in the tabernacle. He said to his priests, You cannot see me until I come back. And they didn't like that, so they looked their heads up into heaven. They looked their heads up into heaven, and the angel came down and said, uh, What are you looking at? <laughs> Busy. Yeah. We're not going to see him in the end of the world. And the next day they held him in their hands. The body and the blood, the soul and the divinity. You cannot touch me. I tell you, you cannot touch me. One of the saints of the Middle Ages, will always forget his name, the young man came to him, very wicked, I want to be an apostle, I want to be a disciple, I want to follow you. And he had a vision. He saw the young man in hell, he said, you're going to hell. No man is going to hell is going to be with me, get away. I want to be an apostle, I want to follow you, get away. No man is, get away, get away, get away. And finally a Lord came down and said, tell him, stop bothering me. Change my mind. Not going to hell. He can be the disciple. Remember Jonas. He may have been a coward, but he wasn't stupid. When Jonas was asked to preach to the Ninevites, you will tell them they're going. The city is going to be burnt, and they're going to be put to death. They're going to die. And Jonas was angry. He said, "I know." I'm going to tell them they're going to die. I'm going to tell them they're going to be punished. I'm going to tell them they're all going to hell. And you're going to change your mind. No, I'm not. Go tell them. I know you, Lord. You're going to change your mind. And I'm going to look like an idiot. Forget it. I'm leaving. So he ran away. Got in the belly of a bale. Got spit up again. He said, okay, I'll go and teach him. And guess what happened? How is it possible for any man to turn away from the divine one? It's the most mysterious thing. Cannot touch me. Cannot touch me. What has happened? It is simply to see God face to face. Simply to be in the presence of the one that we love. That's all that heaven is. Where are we now? What happens at the Holy Communion? What happens if we go to the confessional and say, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned again and again. I absolve you from your sins again and again and again. Why can't we change? Why can't we turn our hearts to Him? The apostles were weeping. They saw Him later that day. It took eight days for Thomas to finally see Him. And they never turned their back on Him. Let's ask the grace that that happens to us. And we don't turn our back on him again. He conquered and destroyed death. He conquered and destroyed hell. He's waiting for us. Why does he love us? I don't know. But I'm sure glad he does. My delight is to be with the sons of men. 
Let our delight to be with Him. Let's ask our Holy Mother to teach us that tonight. She will. And remember, as we're the great battle of the church, we get confused, we get worried, we make foolish decisions. Run to the tomb. Even if it say it's empty, even if he has got many guards. Why do they go there? That's the last place they heard he was. And therefore, that's where they went. Let us go wherever Christ is, not stop traveling on the journey until we find him. So a contemplation there in this holy mystery of the resurrection and victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great victory. It's a confidence in us. And St. Peter was right when he said, without the resurrection our hope is in vain. Our faith is in vain. Our faith is not vain. The fools against us are in vain. But our faith is not in vain. So have a deep faith. Never let go of it. Follow our Holy Mother. Follow Mary Magdalene. Follow St. Peter. Follow Doubting Thomas. Follow the two disciples that ran away to Amos. Somehow we'll find Christ along the way. Father, Son,